reach her at Galena Trachina at Yale. Um, Galena investigates the feedbacks between urbanization, biogeochemical cycles, and climate. Um, she has pioneered a number of studies, including some of the first holistic studies to look at um, the urban carbon cycle. And she was one of the first to really show the urbanization effects on uh, the global cycle of carbon. In her research, she uses um, conceptual and numerical models. She uses a variety of data, satellite data, ground observations, and her studies span a variety of scales from um, more ecosystem scale models to global scale models. And throughout her career, she and her colleagues have made a variety of, of really advances towards our understanding of the urban contributions to the uh, carbon cycle. She's held a number of positions um, really around the world. She's held science positions at the Max Planck Institute for Biogeochemistry, at the Leibniz Center for Agricultural Landscape Research. She was a senior fellow at the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies in Potsdam, that's I-A-S-S. -S. She's held positions at NCAR, also at SNRE, now with a new name I can't remember. Um, she also was at Humboldt uh, University in Berlin. She is Russian. She's trained as a mathematician. She's Russian, but she, most of her academic life has actually been in Germany. Although she did get her PhD here, uh, she studied with Steve Running. Uh, so her background is actually is in forestry and uh, mathematical modeling. So it's a real pleasure to have her here with us here at FES for a year. So please help Thank me in joining. Uh, and welcoming. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, for the nice introduction. Does the microphone work? Yeah? OK. Good. Uh, so this, um, it's my pleasure to be here and presenting the story of urban carbon. I will start with a short announcement for the class that I'm going to teach right after this talk. And I hope the students are here, at least a few of them, right? Okay, very good. Um, so please look for the gaps and uh, research possibilities in this kind of, uh, in the, my presentation and my story and uh, try to formulate two to three research questions uh, around, centered around these uh, gaps. Uh, we will be talking about them later in the class. So please listen carefully and uh, think critically. <laughs> okay, now um, let's uh, get uh, to the story that I'm going to tell today. And um, so carbon is actually, uh, exist in various forms in nature. And uh, these are, um, so it's, it's part of the molecules of the um, living organisms, but also um, inorganic matter. Um, I guess the most, one of the most famous and I guess well-known compounds of that is CO2, and that has uh, one, um, um, so it consists of carbon and two, um, oxygens and its molecule, it's so prominent that its molecule made it even in the title of my presentation. So I, um, let's start with the CO2 first. What do we know about CO2 in the cities? And um, one of the most well-known well facts about uh, carbon in the cities that they emit a lot of CO2. Uh, I think it has been documented in many studies and um, it's considered um, the most prominent effect of cities, of cities on uh, the carbon cycle. It has been considered uh, for a long time. But um, the cities actually are not responsible only for the emissions. And um, in my presentations, I'm going to show that. But uh, first, a look at, let's look at the trends in the urbanization. Um, basically, on the planet Earth that has a lot of a vast, vast amount of space, for some reasons, people prefer to live in the cities. And uh, looking at this trend shown in this image, um, you see that the number of people living in the cities in, is increasing. And, and, this, and it is despite of all the technology that actually make telecommuting possible and uh, <laughs> basically the all the transportation choices that uh, make also the longer distances much shorter in terms of time and also uh, cheaper. They, they make them cheaper. 
So by 2015, uh, the predictions um, show that we will have uh, three quarters of the world population living in the cities. Uh, so, of course, uh, that generates um, a lot of opportunities for people moving to the cities because cities are major check, check. economic one, two, hubs. One, two, check, they are check. centers for creativity. They are centers for um, finance. And, um, but they are also centers of major environmental problems. So, acknowledging that, there was a range of um, city networks and ex that had been um, kind, of, kind of refocusing that their activities around environmental issues in cities and trying to solve them. And one of them is actually uh, mitigating the climate change, uh, reducing the emissions of cities and um, trying basically to get alliances um, of different cities of different sizes on different continents to reduce the emissions so that they can um, uh, have influence um, and have impact and then mitigation of the climate change. What is interesting that uh, the latest network um, that is listed here, I mean, this is just, it's not a full uh, list of networks in, engaged in environmental issues, but uh, the latest one, it's a global parliament of mayors. It was created in the end of 2016. And uh, the founder of this uh, network, he published a book with Yale University Press five years ago. Um, about rising cities and dysfunctional nations, nation states. Do, do you know what this book is? Who has read this book? So uh, this book is, um, was uh, written by uh, Benjamin Barber, um, a political theorist who has made a very, very actually um, strong argument for cities and for their power to change, uh, to make an impact uh, on a range of environmental issues, including the climate change. So he wrote the book, If Mayors Rule the World, and it was published by Yale University Press in 2013. It's a great book, I think. I, I was impressed, I personally was impressed by that. And he was a founder of this uh, global parliament of mayors. So um, in one of the, um, I guess, priority topics on the agenda is mitigating, mitigating climate change. So um, let's see now, let's get to some numbers. So can this activity actually lead to a measurable effect on climate change mitigation? So cities are looking at the emissions and they try to, um, to reduce them. So if you look at the largest, um, to my knowledge, city uh, network, that is involved in mitigating climate change and reducing uh, CO2 emissions, and this is ECLE, um, that is including uh, basically over 1,500 cities and um, which, uh, which actually home for roughly nine, 900 million people. And if all these people would reduce um, their emissions by 1.5 tons of carbon, per person per year, that would lead to roughly 1.5 petagram of carbon per year reduction in the global emissions. That is only 20% of the global emissions that cities are responsible for. And this is if you refer to the number 2000 in 2015. So this is a number that is not really, it's, it's substantial, but they're not, um, going to actually to stop the global warming. I think that according to IPCC gui guidelines, uh, the, this reduction should go up to three to four petagram of carbon per year. So um, in my presentation, I am going through, to go through a few um, points. And first I will talk about the basics of carbon cycling in the urban system. I will, um, then I will uh, show the role of um, cities that they play in the global carbon cycle, basically putting the fluxes that are coming, fluxes and also pools. Cities are not only uh, responsible for the fluxes, but also they generate the pools of carbon. And um, how I put them in the bigger picture, picture of the global carbon cycle. And um, I will also try to show some of the regional scale examples where possible. 
but at some, to some degree it's easier to, at this point, it was easier for me to do this estimates at the global level uh, because a lot of estimates actually exist at this aggregate level and it's more difficult to go and to try to disaggregate them. But it's a look kind of from the top, um, not from the top down, but from bottom up approach. And in the end, I will come back to this question if what cities actually can do uh, more to enhance their impact on the climate change mitigation. So the urban ca carbon cycle. Uh, what I have mentioned already and um, what is the uh, most active uh, part, uh, what is well known uh, part of the uh, carbon cycle of the cities is the emissions. Um, and uh, there is also, we should always, when we think about emissions, we, we should think of flux, right? So the flux goes both ways. It goes out, but there is also something coming in. In addition to that, the cities, um, and the cities actually, what is very important for cities, that there is a footprint, there is a hinterland that is supporting uh, the demand of urbanites for um, food, um, for construction materials, for energy. So a lot of um, materials and carbon actually that is uh, consumed and processed in the cities co comes from the uh, urban footprint basically. So there are these large uh, fluxes of uh, food and fiber, of um, energy basically that is mostly, right now it's mostly fossil fuel, um, different fossil fuel products like coal, oil and gas and um, in the exchange for waste, that's a um, um, result of urban metabolism. Um, so in addition to that, there are indirect effects of the cities on, um, well, on the city areas, but also on the footprint, on the ecosystems that are located in the footprint of the city. And um, these are um, the pollution, pollutants. These are pollutants that are emitted by cities and uh, Sometimes they can have um, a um, positive and sometimes negative effect on the ecosystems that are in the footprint. Um, and in addition to that, uh, cities also play a major role in um, changes in temperature, the heat island effects. And uh, for some continents, like for Europe, that are really have a lot of cities that are densely populated, it was shown that cities actually, and the heat islands, they also play a role in the warming of the regional, in changes in the regional climate and the distribution of precipitation over Europe. So all of this, of course, will affect the fluxes also of the um, ecosystems that um, are located not in the cities but outside of them in the carbon footprint um, of the city. So. How do we calculate all of this? How do we get actually, how do we understand this? How do we see actually, how do we know which uh, pools or which fluxes are more important, which are less important? And as I already said, uh, some of these um, as estimates are easier to make at the larger scale, at the global scale first, and then go back to the different continents or regions or individual cities trying to, uh, to understand um, how, what the carbon cycle is. So I will be showing um, some of the global estimates based on the, um, coming from the model that I created to, to do this, um, to, to basically for the global, uh, for global urban carbon cycle. And um, these are the general assumptions that I used uh, in this um, model. And uh, it's very important that uh, um, the assumptions are known when you present a model and any kind of estimates because it's as valid as much as the assumptions, of course, go. And um, as my uh, senior colleagues were always saying, we're not modeling the Earth, but the Earth-like planet. So, well. So we um, basically, I assumed there were two major um, kind of influ streams of data, one was um, coming on, on, the, on the extent of urban area and the other one on the urban population. So for the urban area, um, I have, um, after some literature search, I have identified that there was a, 
uh, urban green space takes between 10 and 30 percent of the cities on average globally and um, there was no actually data set that would describe like dominant vegetation types in the cities and the larger cities of the world etc so the, my assumption was that it's um, this green areas that are 10 to 30 percent of the covering 10 to 10, 30 percent of the cities are predominantly temperate deciduous forest because many cities actually located in temperate latitudes and even in the cities that are not located in temperate latitudes, um, the deciduous forest and temperate deciduous forest are usually often planted. So, um, these two different streams of um, data have been used for estimates of carbon pathways related, one is was related to the vegetation and soil and uh, the population and um, basically the amount of urban population was behind the calculations that have been used for calculation of variables uh, related to the human and anthropogenic pathways in the system. Um, <coughs> so what did I do about the footprint? That was much more difficult. And um, my idea was uh, to look for the global variables that would be able a proxy that would give me some idea about the city's influence on the footprint, on where, where basically the materials and food coming from. And this kind of proxy exists and it has been in the 80s uh, basically um, published by Vitusek et al, a, a prominent American ecologist, they basically created this concept of um, net primary productivity appropriated by humans as HNPP. And the, the most recent estimate that I found for this HNPP was um, by Haberl et al. They used model simulation to calculate how much harvest uh, was taken out from net primary productivity, uh, kind of was appropriated by humans. So it includes harvest, um, then um, trees that were damaged by harvest, but it, and uh, it includes also land use change and um, the NPP that was uh, actually changed or influenced by uh, land use change and uh, soil degradation. So net primary productivity, and maybe for some of you it's a new term, it's um, it's amount of uh, biomass basically in in um, produced each year by uh, by green plants, and um, it's amount of carbon sequestered per year in in a plant. So uh, scientists who study croplands, uh, they can basically they pull out a plant that is uh, per a kind of annual plant and, they, and um, measure it. And this is basically its NPP. That's the amount that is uh, grown during one year and sequestered in a plant. Um, so this is how I uh, calculated them. That's what I used for, for my calculations for the influence of the cities on the footprint. And then, um, I calculated carbon uptake and carbon release, the influence of carbon uptake and release on the, um, um, in the footprint, basically on this fluxes uh, using this equation that includes some uh, coefficients, basically that scale down the amount of NPP, just taking the amount like that 60%, 50 to 70% actually here, I assume that 70 to 50 to, 50 to 70 percent of HNPP was uh, appropriated by urban dwellers and uh, then I scaled up it further to calculate uh, from NPP the gross uh, carbon uptake and gross carbon release. So now I will go through uh, individual fluxes, carbon, net carbon uptake, net carbon release and also the carbon pools that are in the cities and show some, some global estimates uh, that are based on these assumptions that I just presented and also I show a few um, regional scale estimates where I could do that basically to see that the 
Of course, the, there is a variability in the fluxes and, uh, and the pools if you look at different um, areas of the world. Um, so let's, let's see, uh, one step, go one step back. So there are two different processes uh, behind the carbon uptake in the cities, and one is photosynthesis by green plants. And these plants can be in the gardens, they can be on the roofs, on the walls, anywhere. And the second is the carbonation. Carbonation is, um, it's basically the opposite chemical process uh, to the process that is calcination that is used in the production of um, uh, cement. Um, the carbonation is, um, is basically the, the way that CO2 is diffuses in the uh, porous uh, materials that contain cement and then bind with calcium oxide. So if we look at the magnitude of these fluxes, um, we see that uh, the urban vegetation um, is uptaking uh, roughly 0 0.2 uh, tetragram of carbon per year, and uh, it's comparable actually with what just recently um, was published by Xi et al. Um, and this is a global number for the uh, cement carbonation around the world. And, but these numbers, both of these numbers, are substantially smaller, of course, than uh, the amount of carbon that is uptaken during photosynthesis in the carbon footprint, and that is influenced by the city. So if you look, for instance, at the US, uh, for the regional, there are regional differences, as I said. Um, we see that the trees, urban trees, and uh, for the US, there is a very good, actually, data set uh, for different cities, so that, um, and um, David Novak and uh, Peter Crane, they calculated uh, the, the amount of carbon that is sequestered um, on average per year by American um, trees, trees in the cities. So, um, and I compared it to the cement carbonation that is also um, um, presented in this paper that has just recently came out. Uh, for the U.S., you see that there is a large difference. Uh, so basically, the reason why the carbon, gross carbon uptake is um, so large at the global scale, it's because of China, because China producing a lot of cement, and um, basically over 70% of um, cement carbonation that um, has been um, calculated in this paper is happening now in China. So in the U.S., um, the number is substantially smaller, and it's basically yeah, it's one quarter of the, what the trees sequester. Now let's go to the carbon relief. Um, so the carbon, the, there are also different processes. There are natural and anthropogenic processes uh, behind the carbon release in the cities. And um, natural processes, these are plant respiration, and decomposition of organic matter on one hand, and the anthropogenic processes, uh, these are the fossil fuel burning and decomposition of waste. Um, so these processes I also tried to quantify it at the global scale, and the um, numbers uh, that I came up with um, basically look like this, with the <coughs> fossil fuel obviously dominating the picture at this point. Uh, plants and soils uh, of the cities, they emit very little by comparison because of the well, small size. And uh, landfills that also here included not only CO2 but also methane emissions uh, because the landfills obviously emit not only CO2 and actually they emit more methane than CO2 but and, uh, it's an also an important greenhouse gas. Uh, so these numbers are substantially smaller than what the fossil fuel emissions are. However, again, if you look, compare it to the estimates of the emissions from the soil, from the footprint, and this is mostly the emissions from the soil respiration of the city, city's footprint from the vegetation that is um, where people appropriate um, the um, productivity, which productivity the urban dwellers appropriate, um, this is number is substantially higher. 
Um, so here again, here we look at the balance of between carbon, net carbon release and uh, net carbon uptake in uh, three different uh, areas. And um, of course the cities are very different and, and some cities have um, very densely populated and here you see the Boston as an example. And um, uh, Rochester is, I guess, less populated. And um, on the, uh, the very first picture, you see Harvard Forest that is uh, primarily, primarily basically rural. Uh, so in f and you, you see here three fluxes that are abbreviated uh, with them using the abbreviations basically that are common with um, eco ecologists, but maybe not so known to you. So the GPP is a net carbon uptake, air eco, this is ecosystem respiration, and FFCO is the fossil fuel burning. So if we calculate the carbon balances of these areas, you see that only this um, area that is forested and rural is actually a carbon sink, so it basically sequester carbon. And uh, the city, but the city, the actually the Worcester with uh, low density urban uh, housing, low density, it doesn't seem to uh, be so far to be a large sink uh, source on the other hand. So <coughs> potentially redu reduction of emissions in areas like this could lead to the uh, changing the um, kind of the the sign of this uh, carbon balance into minus if um, the kind of the emission reductions um, work. However, in the areas with a high density, like Boston, the uh, fossil fuel emissions, uh, of course, uh, they're dominating. So we have a um, net source of carbon, basically, in this area. So now we jump to the next picture. And um, it has two, um, uh, two different kind of ecosystem, different systems. So it has um, a tropical forest and a picture of the urban area. So the question is, what do they have in common? Now I showed you that they're very different on the previous slide, that um, in terms of carbon balance, they're very different because the urban areas are basically carbon sources and the, um, rural areas are um, their carbon sinks potentially. But they do have something in common. And um, what they have in common is uh, the carbon density, the amount of carbon that is stored in them. And um, we did this estimation with uh, colleagues at the University of Michigan um, a few years ago. And we were actually surprised that um, the, the cities the carbon density in the city is comparable to the one that is in the tropical forest. So later, a similar study was uh, done for China and uh, they came up with um, the numbers in similar ranges but slightly lower than what we, did, what, what we had for the US and it can be attributed to the smaller uh, vegetation um, areas in the cities but also to, the, to less um, wood used in the buildings. So why do cities actually have, uh, and where do they store all this carbon? Um, in, a, in a comparison to the natural systems, um, cities have more carbon pools. And these are not, not nature, not necessarily natural, like forest, like trees or soils, but these are also the buildings. So, and also potentially landfills. Uh, so here we have uh, this nice cone hole that is, um, has quite a bit of wood in there. So this is actually carbon storage. I'm still curious to have a tour of this building to find out how much co carbon is actually, how much wood has been used here, how much carbon it stores. Um, so there are more pools in the city and um, these uh, pools are not so well investigated. So we did some uh, estimates it's again from the same study with colleagues from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And uh, for the US, we had a, a pretty good data set um, where we could um, basically distinguish between different uh, 
types of urban areas be between ex-urban areas and urban areas, and um, we could get some reasonably good data to, to come up with um, estimates for all these schools, for both of these uh, types of urban areas. Um, so for instance, for vegetation, we had um, used this equation, so we could, we had estimates for the grasslands uh, areas in the cities and also for the forests, so we can distinguish between them and between their soils. Um, and um, for the buildings, uh, we also found some data on um, amount of, of wood used in buildings in different parts of the US. Um, and uh, we could basically um, scale it up with the number of people in, um, in different types of urban areas. So when we sum up all these numbers, we came up with a pretty large number that uh, we um, that was um, actually larger than amount of carbon stored in the croplands in the U.S. Uh, it was 18 petagram, and it was roughly one tenth of the total ecosystem storage of carbon in all U.S. ecosystems. So uh, let's jump now from the U.S. to the global estimates. And um, at the global estimates, we have um, basically the global estimates show that um, there is substantially, still substantially amount of uh, carbon um, stored in buildings and in soils, but also uh, the landfills have a large, uh, it's a large pool of carbon. Um, and vegetation, with vegetation basically being the smallest one because of the limited area uh, that um, vegetation basically and green spaces occupy in most uh, cities. So, so we talked about different vertical carbon fluxes and we talked about the pools. Um, we also s did some uh, one study where we tried to look at the indirect effect of urbanization on the uh, carbon fluxes in the footprint. Um, that was um, done with uh, different tools. That was done with a pretty uh, sophisticated set of models. Basically, we, we looked at urban expansion. Um, we, looked, we basically had Europe and we had data for that. Uh, so we had uh, urban expansion that we calculated ourselves. That was uh, basically urban or non-urban, it was not very sophisticated current, <laughs> what to do. And um, we had, in, we wanted to look at the changes on climate. When, if you build cities, they change climate, so what effect does it have on the land atmosphere carbon flux of Europe? And uh, the last factor was the atmospheric pollution. So to do that, we had actually employed uh, several models. We had um, climate model, um, Mesoscale, climate mesoscale model, MM5, uh, with some modifications for urban areas. We had atmospheric transport model, TM3, to calculate the um, CO2 uh, footprints of the cities. And in the end, it was all fed into the ecosystem model that calculated basically uh, this indirect effect of all these uh, factors on the uh, land atmosphere carbon flux of Europe. So there was a lot of computer power behind it. All these calculations were actually done at the um, major computer, supercomputer in, in Hamburg, um, at the climate center, um, computational center for climate uh, research. So um, I cannot really show the equations. It's, it's, it's a, lot of, uh, a lot of them. <laughs> and there are complicated models b behind it and many hours of uh, simulations actually underlying that. But in the end, we got this um, um, basically figure where we, that shows that urban expansion, basically it consumes, it, it reduces the carbon and it emits, it leads to emissions. It's, an, it's a small uh, source of carbon. Uh, climate change uh, affects also the, negatively the carbon cycle of the ecosystems, it's, um, the climate becomes warmer, at least in Europe, and there is also less precipitation in summer. 
um, or it's they fall, don't fall where they actually should, so there is also negative change. But to other uh, components, uh, such as increase in CO2, CO2 well, that is emitted from the cities, and deposition of nitrogen, they actually um, increased uh, the carbon uptake of the ecosystems that were outside of the cities. So in the end, when we, the, the overall effect was a small uh, carbon sink as a result of urbanization in this, um, in Europe. If this is true, I'm not, I don't know, because there, there are many other negative effects that urbanization carries with, with it. And um, the, in this model simulation, it was like a pilot study uh, we couldn't account for everything. For instance, ozone, definitely there are, um, in, s in some areas of Europe, there are problems with ozone. They do have negative effects on the ecosystems. We didn't account for that. So let's come to the global picture. Um, and uh, let's try to put this um, fluxes that I showed before, calculated for gross carbon uptake gross carbon for carbon release and uh, also the pools and the bigger picture of the carbon cycling on the earth. So uh, the first slide shows basically the, uh, the pre-industrial fluxes and uh, pools and uh, their magnitudes on the earth. And I'm sure that many of you have seen it many times. It has been published and uh, revised again and IPCC report and um, there is a global carbon project that is following up on that. Um, so the, this onset of industrialization, um, there, are, there were some new fluxes and this pr prominent fluxes um, that have been created by humans. And this is one is from the fossil fuel burning and the second from the land use change. And um, with uh, basically onset on for urbanization, we started depleting the pool of uh, carbon in the, um, in the, like the fossil fuel pool of carbon. Uh, the soil pool, pool of carbon uh, started also de being depleted because of the land use change and then um, the atmospheric pool of carbon started increasing. Um, in, a, in addition to that, we have um, changes in the carbon uptake. So basically ocean and uh, vegetation are now small carbon sinks um, that partially compensate actually for the growth of um, carbon and increase of CO2 in the atmosphere. So actually without these two sinks, uh, the atmospheric carbon would be accumulating much, much faster. So what, uh, how do the urban fluxes and uh, urban areas look like um, in this context? So buildings, um, my estimates showed that basically humans created two new pools. And uh, this is pool that of carbon that is stored in buildings around the world. And the second is the, um, it's a carbon pool in the uh, landfills. And these are not so small, basically. They are substantial. And people never really thought of storing, for instance, carbon in the buildings. And um, they also I've, um, had an impact and um, partially, I mean, in case of fossil fuel burning, uh, they are actually majorly, mainly responsible for this um, flux for the 70% of that. But they also have, uh, the impact on the uptake of carbon uh, in the vegetation and also release of carbon in vegetation because of this uh, footprint uh, link. Um, so these numbers show amount of carbon stored in urban vegetation and uh, in the soils that are in the urban areas. And um, this, of course, could be refined in the future once we know more about the vegetation and um, about the uh, soils um, in different parts of the world. What I couldn't quantify here actually is the effect of um, cities on the ocean or aquatic systems. Um, I don't know if um, there is definitely, we cannot deny that there is a large flux, influx of nutrients coming from the cities. 
I mean, I think eight out of 10 larger, largest um, agglomeration, urban agglomeration are located at the coast. So we cannot deny that there is a large uh, influx of phosphorus and nitrogen coming into the ocean uh, with all kinds of um, water sewage system or storm water. And in addition to that, there is most likely also pollutants that are coming from the cities and deposited in the sea. But I haven't been able to find uh, any proxies that would allow me to do that. So this is a big question that uh, I couldn't solve. I also couldn't uh, look at, at the global scale. I was not able to see how the emissions, emissions with of uh, cities, emissions of um, pollutants, for instance, how they affect the, uh, these fluxes in the vegetation or in the ocean. So this indirect effect, um, an indirect effect of temperature increase, uh, higher temperature in the cities, um, it's also, they are not also included here. Um, so there are still many questions around um, cities and their role in carbon cycle um, that, are, that are here for us to answer for the scientists. But uh, let's return to the cities engagement. And I started uh, basically my talk about talking about cities engagement and uh, about all these networks uh, that currently exist and um, that are trying to, um, to be active and to actually to do something that can make a difference. So right now they're focusing really only on emissions. And I guess um, as a uh, scientist uh, looking into the carbon cycle, I would say that they need to look a little bit more beyond that. They, look, they have to look at the fluxes, not only outputs, but also the inputs. So they need to look at the fluxes. But another part that is completely missing now from the scope is actually the carbon pools. That the cities, um, I think, missing an opportunity on mitigating the, the, without basic, uh, not looking at the pools that they can create. This uh, strong urbanization trend that we observe um, that um, definitely can be used to create a new um, and probably to increase the pool of carbon that um, is cousin, currently present and um, at the global uh, scale, it's um, basically a significant pool that is there. Uh, so potentially one can try to store more carbon also in the urban ecosystems, in urban systems, in the buildings. Um, and um, we have to think how to do that. Um, what are the pools that um, would be beneficial for, for us to store the carbon? And um, I've uh, talked about various pools that um, cities um, actually have. That's something that still have to be investigated. And of course, in different areas of the world, um, the answer could be also different. Um, but um, I think that's definitely a worth of investigation. And um, I will um, close my talk now. I think I'm well on time. Um, saying that I hope that in the future, uh, cities uh, may become a future carbon jungle. So the, the future trajectory of the carbon um, balance on the earth is definitely will be heavily dependent on cities and how they grow and how they deal with carbon. So the um, perspective for future carbon jungle, I see it's the possible solution. Thank you. Thank you, that was great. Um, I struggle a little bit with the footprint concept. Um, you know, I, I sort of, I understand what you're doing and, and, it, and it provides a lot of insights, but to some degree, it seems like, you know, if you have someone living in an urban environment and you, and you remove them from that in urban, urban environment, uh, you're not changing perhaps their, their CO2 footprint per se, right? It's only if they move out of the urban environment and their footprint in the rural or the suburban area is much different is when you get the change to sort of the, the global carbon footprint picture. So I, I'm wondering if, if, if this happens at all in your um, research and thinking where, 
you know, you're not thinking about the total number of people living in cities and their footprint, but how their footprint is different than suburban or rural folks and, and how the, the movement of people between these uh, different landscapes will impact the overall budget. This is a very good question. I was thinking about this too. I also was trying to find some numbers for different types of settlements and how the footprints of their inhabitants look like. And um, um, you know what is uh, the best way in terms of w which settlements actually have the smallest footprint? This, these settlements, they are also here in the US and these are eco-villages. Um, so the people living in the eco-villages, their footprint is 40 times smaller than of uh, average American on the left. And these are the numbers from the, from the US. So I found a few uh, articles actually on that. There is a research going on in this direction. And I completely agree with you that it, it does depend on where the people are and what actually they do, how they, how they consume, right, in the end, what they eat and um, how they hit their buildings. There are also this, um, I mean, there, is a, there are a lot of eco-villages. I'm not sure if this is the place where I would like to live. I visited one eco-village in Germany, actually, that was located near Berlin. Um, um, it was very interesting, I think, what they do and um, how they do that. Um, but it's a matter of taste, really. I mean, yeah. But it's, yeah, it's a great question. It's a great research topic, actually, to look at, yeah. Uh, thank you for a great talk. Um, I have two small questions. One about the <coughs> urban pools. I'm thinking of material science. Um, are urban pools urban sinks as well, or permanent urban sinks, depending on the material of the building? And what materials are the most effective? That's on the one hand. And then I have a different question on respiration. Is that um, plant respiration or is it also human? It's also human respiration. I calculated also human respiration. I can start right away from the second the, question. The, the reason I'm asking is because the, in the city there was a lot less respiration than in the countryside. Yes. Which is very uh, surprising. Uh, but how about the first question? So the qu first question is about the materials, right? And what would be the better forms of materials to store carbon? Is it right? Yes. Store permanently. Meaning store permanent. Yeah, that yeah. That so it doesn't... Uh, becomes a sink. It, it, so it's uh, kind of stored there forever. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess the immediate answer that I could... Uh, give us, I guess the first guess is the wood. If it's properly uh, kind of treated, etc., it can be a carbon sink, but it's, uh, after some time it will be, um, if the building is demolished, um, eventually some of this carbon, even if it's protected kind of wood and uh, preserved, uh, it will end up in the air. There is a new material that, w that is actually um, been developed in Germany, uh, it's made of biochar. It's made of biochar and um, they basically propose to use um, this material in the building and it has 80% carbon. So it's, it has higher uh, percentage of carbon than wood. Wood is roughly 50, around 50. And uh, this material has 80% because it's made of biochar, it's black. I mean, it's and it has, it doesn't decompose. So the develop of these materials, they claim that it doesn't decompose. So if you demolish the building, you can either uh, grind these um, parts that are made of this and uh, then recycle it and build a new kind of uh, building or put it in a new panel uh, made of this. And, or you can de deposit it somewhere and it will stay there forever because it's like uh, charcoal de facto. Well, We'll see if it's, there is a future behind it, I don't know. I mean, they just recently got a major award from the foundation 
that this, um, in Germany, uh, actually it's a European Foundation on Climate Peak that is funding the startups uh, that um, addressing and trying to, meet, to mitigate the uh, global the climate change. So we'll see, maybe that will uh, help. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the very, very nice talk. Uh, it's really interesting. So I have a question about, I uh, just make me think about uh, um, the carbon storage in the uh, in the cities, for example, like think about a, a building. You know, it's just, to me, um, some of the carbon sto stored here is just uh, like, transfer. if we think about it in a larger context, it's just trees, you know, used to be stored in a tree, someone in, in somewhere else, you know, some other places. So, if we say you know a city has higher density of carbon storage you know in the buildings, what 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 are the implications? I mean uh, you know in globally, or or you know think in a larger context. Thinking of, of forests or thinking of uh, what? Um, I guess my question is, um, um, it's really interesting to think about you know uh, like in in cities, it can store have higher um, carbon storage right for example if buildings more like this have more have more use more woods and it can be um, higher have higher density of carbon storage but at the same time this wood is just uh, to me you know more, some of them just would shift from say another place it used to be a forest right it's also kind of same it's also carbon storage there it just shift from one place to here so what are the implications if a city have a f higher carbon storage compared to a low carbon storage, if that is the case? So this is just, I'm not quite clear about this. Um, if, if our planet conti will continue to urbanize, people will have to live somewhere, right? Yeah. So they, we will continue build, building, constructing buildings, right? So, um, we can make them out of concrete, of course, but we can make them out of wood. So if you make them, I guess, out of wood or this biochar-based material, yes, you will take the carbon from somewhere else where you could probably store it, but the carbon um, th that you take from there, um, and if it's reforested, assume that it's a good scenario, it will be reforested so trees will regrow or some other plants will regrow because biochar is not always made of trees, it's made of agricultural, um, leftovers also. Um, so this assumption that you can um, basically can grow this trees and grow these plants back. So they, this carbon storage will be replenished after some time. In addition, you will have uh, another carbon storage in the, in the city. If you build this concrete, that doesn't happen, right? So you use then um, actually 50% of the a wood harvested now globally is a fuel wood. It's used as a fuel wood. It's just burned. So it's um, we do har harvest a lot of forest and we have deforestation, but we do really have um, we, we use it for something else, not the, the buildings. Actually, there is a very small fraction that is used for the for, uh, building. So that's the idea. 